with the schedule. Quite a crowd. Okay. Well, good morning, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our uh, August uh, Mitchell Institute uh, Forum uh, today. Our uh, subject is the Next Generation Air Dominance, or uh, NGAD. And for those of you I haven't had the good fortune to meet yet, uh, my name is Dave Deptula. I'm the Dean of the Mitchell Institute um, for Aerospace Power Studies. Um, and we're uh, pleased also to have with us today the President of the Air Force Association, Lieutenant General Bruce Wright, um, amongst a whole set of distinguished visitors to include uh, General Mike Lowe, former Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force and uh, Commander of the First Commander of Air Combat Command. And we've got an expert panel with us today to discuss this topic. Say again. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey, they're all youngsters, sir. You know that. Welcome to being retired. Uh, anyway, we've got a great panel this morning to discuss this uh, topic, and uh, we plan the session to ensure that there's a lot of feedback uh, and discussion. Uh, but before I introduce our panelists, what I thought I'd do is uh, offer a couple of remarks to set the stage um, for the discussion. Air superiority, the ability to deny enemy forces access to key portions of the sky, is today a bedrock mission for the Department of Defense. Everybody over there in each one of the services understands that the viability of soldiers and Marines on the ground, ships at sea, space and cyber installations, logistics lines, and command and control facilities are fundamentally dependent on this mission. America's air superiority capability and capacity, however, is becoming more challenged. And while all the services contribute to this mission, the vast percentage is executed by the Air Force, which saw its fighter aircraft inventory cut by over half in the years since the Cold War. Fifth generation fighters like the F-22 were prematurely canceled, and the F-35 full rate production was delayed. The result is increasingly geriatric airframes dating from the Carter and Reagan administrations on flight lines today well past their intended service lives. During the same period, the combat demand for fighter aircraft increased with nearly three decades worth of nonstop deployments to the Mideast. Remember, the Air Force has been at war since 1991, not just since 2001. Meeting the sustained tempo with a decreasing supply of aging aircraft have pushed both pilots, support personnel, and aircraft to the brink. The result is increasing risk for the nation's defense. The NGAD program is therefore especially important because it will allow a clean sheet approach to merge the demands of securing air superiority with the attributes necessary to prevail in the information age. Every aircraft sitting on a fighter ramp today was designed before the smartphone redefined the way we gather, process, and share information. These same trends have had an impact on modern combat operations. Just as a landline is of diminishing value, so too are the vast percentage of aircraft that currently comprise our fighter aircraft inventory. Over 80% of the Air Force's fighter aircraft today are based on designs from the late 60s and early 70s. Considering that too few F-22s were bought and circumstances of delayed planned F-35 buys, the NGAD program represents a crucial need to reset the nation's air superiority force. Now, design concepts are still classified, but it's expected that stealth-enabled superiority, advanced electronic warfare capabilities, robust sensors, processing power, and the ability to share data in a real-time, collaborative fashion will stand as key attributes. It's also likely that NGAD will not be one specific aircraft. Rather, it will comprise a system of manned and unmanned aircraft that will integrate network teaming to deliver desired mission effects. Regardless of the system specifics, it's critical that the NGAD program move ahead as scheduled. That said, budget cuts recently enacted by the House Appropriations Defense Subcommittee targeted the Air Force's next generation air dominance program and they are putting the future of the nation's air superiority at risk. As the Office of Management and Budget recently explained, and I quote, this 50% reduction in funding would result in a three-year slip in advanced development timelines and the cancellation of critical new te technology 
production programs, unquote. Now, while some may question the cost of the program, it's important to, que to ask a different question. What's the cost of not securing the sky? Victory is simply impossible without it, and countless lives will be put at risk. Taken in that light, the Hack D 50% cut to this program stands as the truly unaffordable path forward. So with that bit of a background, let me introduce our panelists, and let's uh, get on to hearing their perspectives. Um, on my immediate left is retired Lieutenant General John Dog Davis. He served as the Marine Corps Deputy Commandant for Aviation as his last command. In the course of his career, he's flown over 4,500 hours in the AV-8, the F-5, and the FNA-18. He was also the Deputy Commander, United States Cyber Command. So he's fully aware of the importance of being uh, what networks are all about and cyber's all about. Today, he's an independent consultant and national commander of the Marine Corps Aviation Association. Sitting next to him is Major General Mike Fanman Fantini. He's the Director, Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability, or AFWIC. In this position, he leads Air Force efforts for the design, integration, and capability development for future Air Force concepts. He served as a squadron, group, and wing commander and has more than 3,200 hours in the MQ-9, F-16, T-37, and T-38. And finally, on the far end of the table is Major General Dave Cooler Crum. He's the Director of Global Power Programs in the Air Force's Acquisition Arm, where he's responsible for directing, planning, and programming of more than 159 fighter, bomber, missile, and weapons programs. He's an Air Force Weapons School graduate in the F-15 and has commanded an F-22 squadron and wing, along with multiple strategy and requirement staff positions on the Joint Staff, Secretary of Defense Staff, and at the United States Air Force. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have General Fantini kind of kick off, followed by uh, General Crum, and then uh, wrap up by General Davis. So uh, Fan Man, over to you. Thanks, sir, and uh, thanks to everyone uh, for showing today and to AFA for hosting and Mitchell in particular for uh, their advocacy. Uh, as the uh, Director of Warfighting Integration, I tend to swim in a deeper pool of the concept side of the house, and that's probably where I'll uh, kind of drop my proverbial anchor there to uh, give a tip of the hat to the Naval Services of the Navy and Marine Corps. But uh, as you know, uh, we're in this increasingly competitive environment with Russia and China as they present this global challenge to our nation. I mean, the uh, really interesting thing is I've not seen in 33 years uh, the department come together and centered on a uh, document of this national defense strategy that has allowed us to focus on this near-peer competitive space. But make no mistake about it, that. We need to continue to execute our core missions of homeland defense, foundational nuclear deterrence, prepare and be able to defeat that peer adversary while holding another one at bay, and then finally continuing uh, to engage in the countering violent extremist or, uh, challenge. You know, and, and that is a uh, tall feat. We will not be able to accomplish that without the ability to continue to control the skies. And as I thought to prepare my remarks, I kind of harken back to 35 years ago when folks would say uh, engaging the enemy one at a time was defined as air superiority. As I've matured in my thinking throughout that time, I came to realize that the enemy got a vote. <laughs> and we've learned from that. And the reality is, that air superiority is going to give us the freedom of maneuver that enables our joint forces to execute whatever mission our nation asks us to do. So without that ability to conduct that uh, mission of air superiority, uh, unless we really understand how we're going to pull this together from the multi-domain operations perspective and the true ability that we have a vision for of connecting any sensor to any shooter of any service across any domain. When we're able to realize that and maintain that decision superiority over our adversaries, we'll be able to accomplish air superiority at a time and place of our choosing. 
And more importantly, it's really a conversation of how are we creating air, space, and cyber superiority at a time and place of our choosing that allows us to gain that freedom of maneuver in the air domain. So the next generation air superiority flight plan, the air superiority 2030 work that went on uh, two or three years ago, that has given us a template of, of what we need to look to the future and what we need to do with respect to resourcing uh, these various capabilities. When you ask me as the Director of Warfighting Integration, what do we see in the future? We see the ability to fight in, from, and through space. We see the ability to truly connect this sensor to shooter with multi-domain command and control, joint all domain command and control, if you will. We have to be able to generate combat power both inside and outside the proverbial bubble, right? We have to be able to fight uh, while under attack, and we have to be able to fight from distance. And the reality is we're going to blend these things together. And so when we start talking about the mission of air superiority, we are talking about bringing these things together in a multi-domain operation for that freedom of maneuver. And then obviously, we have got to figure out against how the adversary is producing capabilities to counter ourselves or to counter our nation, is how do we do the sustainment and logistics side of the house? And, and that's why when you talk air superiority, you talk cyber superiority, you talk space superiority, we look at it now from a holistic perspective of an enterprise approach, which is why my organization pretty much stood up. And so uh, we see this as an enterprise challenge. We don't want to have a conversation of widgets. We want to have a conversation on how the highway brings any proverbial truck into the fight. And how does that do that effectively? And so right now, we plan to show our investments in, in pivoting to the future along those four areas that I talked about, space, multi-domain, command and control, the ability to generate combat power, and we have to do this with logistics support under attack. Uh, and that's where we see the vision of air superiority in the future, pulling these things together. And so with that, I'm, I'm happy to hand over to my good friend, Major General, Cooler Crump, and I'll take your questions as needed there. Thanks, General Fantini. Uh, I'll say good morning, everyone, as well. I look out in the crowd and I see friends, I see mentors, I see icons, and I would like all of you to remember statute of limitations. <laughs> the things that I may have said or done uh, in the past. Uh, a special thanks to General Wright uh, and General Deptula for hosting us. Sirs, thank you for what you've done, your service, and your continued advocacy for air power and the things that uh, we do. And uh, it's uh, great to be here uh, with you uh, for this venue. I do have to tell you, though, I was asked a few months ago by General Wright would I come talk, and I, of course, was thrilled to do so and honored to do so, but uh, what I forgot was the, what we call the speech topic assignment part of the ask. And so I felt like I was back in eighth grade when I was the last one to the teacher, and my book report had to be on War and Peace. So when you talk about next generation air dominance, uh, that's the sort of magnitude. And certainly there's nothing I could say in a short period of time that would encompass it. But we'll give you kind of a thoughts on what our vision is for uh, air superiority in the future and where do we think we're going. And so the first thing I want to impress upon you is what NGAD is not. It is not a thing. It is not a platform. It is not a substitute. The next generation of air superiority is a networked, connected family of systems that works together to get after the things we need to get after for our nation to ensure air superiority. It is not one thing. It is a multitude of things. And so when you see us pursuing NGAD, what we are pursuing is a multiple number of technologies and capabilities that we can bring to bear in the ways that General Fantini talked about to you. And it's from every domain. It's from cyber, it's from air, it's from sea, it's from land, and it's from space. And all of that connected is what we want it to be. And the other thing that we know about what NGAD will be is that it will be constantly evolving. There is no more flag in the sand 
and for the next series of decades, we've ensured air superiority for our nation. It's going to be constantly changing. The chief talks about the, the P's of next generation air dominance. We know that whatever it, we bring to bear, it has to be able to penetrate. How does it penetrate? Well, a multitude of ways. Stealth, speed. It can penetrate in quantity by overwhelming uh, the enemy as we go forward. It has to persist. That means range, that means loiter, that means endurance, but it means orbital, it means air, it means cyber, it means being able to persist inside the enemy's defenses. And I will tell you that it has to protect. It has to protect itself. Maybe it has to protect others. So we've got to build this network of systems together, and then it has to proliferate. And proliferate does not mean necessarily just quantity. It also means connected. So by connecting people and by connecting all the different capabilities that we have together, we proliferate those capabilities across the network and make it a lot stronger. And finally, of course, it has to be able to punish. Air superiority means being able to take over the battle space from the enemy and do that. And the, the way that we th are thinking about this is, again, not a single platform, not a single thing, but a network of things that everything connects, everything that shares data. And so people talk about, well, does that mean only new things? And it does not. It means everything contributes and everything brings something together. And it's changed the way that we design, build, test, train, and sustain these new technologies. And when we talk about this, and you've heard my boss, Dr. Roper, the chief of Air Force Acquisitions, talk about a Century Series idea. And the Century Series idea is rooted in the, what we did in the 50s. And that is we built a series of different airplanes to, to prove out. We've got the same mindset when it comes to developing capabilities. It, but it's not airplanes, it's technologies. It's rapidly being able to innovate. It's yeah. using digital design, modeling, and simulation. So people talk about, well, the Century Series built a number of airplanes that weren't very good as well. Well, if we do the right way of digital modeling and digital simulation, what we can do is rapidly prototype and look at what different capabilities and designs can do in that digital model. And we can go and fail and succeed in the digital world very fast. And where things are promising, then we rapidly move to prototyping. And the, the, the promise of digital engineering and digital modeling and simulation is that we can look at things not just in the design phase, but in the production phase and in the sustainment phase. So we can take uh, a good look at what different parts and different components will mean. I will tell you that too often we look at just the production numbers of a system, but it's the sustainment of that system that costs us in the long run. And we know we have to do this because of all the things that like General Del Tula talked about, technology is moving very rapidly. And if no one believes, I hope, that today's technology is going to be the same five years from now, three years from now, maybe six months from now. So how do we design capabilities and systems that are rapidly upgradable, that are modular in nature? What we know is we, we've got to be able to do this on a very quick cycle, why we're so excited about digital engineering and digital acquisition. And when we look at those things and we we've, we've lay out the scope, what we know is we have to have that on government reference architectures that allow us to take the best and brightest from all of our industry partners and integrate them quickly on, into those systems. Next generation of air dominance is not a thing. It's not a truck. It's a series of capabilities and technologies that we're developing to work together. They're connected and the highway is what gets us going. And when we look to the future, the future is not as General Deptula just said, or, or you did, uh, fan man, you know, the old mentality was one-on-one -on -one engagement. This NGAD is not a one-for-one -one replacement of fighters or anything else. It is a system of things designed to complement and help each other as we go forward. I'll turn it over to General Davis. Sir. Hey, thanks so much. Hey, 
Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, Dave, thank you very much for inviting me from my, my mountain lair in uh, North Idaho. Um, it's the, really, this is my, uh, my coming out. I've been uh, two years up there and uh, really thankful for what, the Mich what you and the Mitchell Institute does to basically tell a story, uh, have a forum for open debate, to share ideas and uh, to work on, on getting this right. So it's interesting too, the Marine Corps is not, I would say not actively involved in the NGED program, but we view the F-35 and I'm not speaking for the Marine Corps today, I'm speaking as the guy who ran Marine Aviation two years ago and, and a private citizen who really wants to get this right. It's, you know, we, we live in, in trying times and frankly, we've lived in trying times for a long time. When I was a young guy, I was in exchange with the British at the closest jet base to the East German border. We were ready for uh, you know, the, the, the Cold War to be a real war, and uh, I learned a lot about what, uh, what potential high attrition combat was gonna be like. And it wasn't an Air Force fight, it wasn't a Royal Air Force fight, it wasn't an Army fight, it wasn't a Navy fight, it wasn't a Marine fight, it wasn't a coalition, it was gonna be a coalition fight and everybody was gonna play. But I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot about um, preparing for that fight and also what uh, I worked for General Krulak uh, after that um, basically, the, the wars that flowed from the, from the end of the, the Gulf War, um, you know, what General Krulak used to call the, the, the stepchild of Chechnya, right? All the different kind of fights out there. And one, the one thing as a student of history, and I have had a chance to read quite a bit in the last two years, is we really suck at predicting the future. We are terrible at that. But we, at this desk up here, I used to, these two gents on my left do now, and all of us as, as citizens, um, have a responsibility to be ready for the fight that looms in our bow. And since we can't predict what that fight's going to be, we need to be ready for the worst case and protect our freedom, protect our friends, protect our way of life. So I feel very strongly about that as a retired person. And so I'll, I'll, I'll talk from that vantage point as we go forward here. So the Marine Corps um, is very involved in an F-35. I brought that uh, program in um, and it's doing well. Um, it's doing well. And I would say what we're looking for in we don't look for a straight fighter. We look for an airplane that serves a variety of customers. And we, like my friends on the table here, we fight as a team. Slightly different focus sometimes um, than others, but uh, no better, just different focus. Our focus is this Marine Air Ground Task Force. That's what we, we, we try to optimize that Marine Air Ground Task Force. And again, it's a mini uh, joint construct in many ways, but also in order to do that, we have to plug into the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and our coalition partners. Um, we believe we're the force that has to be most ready when the nation's least ready. Knowing full well that people can pontificate about having the future suitcased, we know what it's gonna be. Um, we just believe that's not the case. We have to be ready for the worst. And uh, so we're, we, we invested and we're investing, continue to invest, and I checked with uh, the, um, the Commandant's planning guidance and uh, the, the, the Marine requirements folks, a fifth generation force, and we're, we're pressing down that road. Uh, we will be at a fifth generation force and a solely fifth generation force in the, in the 2030s. Uh, we're transitioning airplanes right now and squadrons right now, and we've been forward deployed multiple times to include combat with VMFA 211, um, and uh, VM, uh, VMFA 121 is out at sea as we speak tonight. And then forward deployed in uh, land bases and, and uh, austere locations. Um, for us, any kind of a next generation air dimes, and frankly, we think we're gonna fly the F-35 for a long, long time. So we're looking, just like my friend said, at, at a capability, more like an iPhone, right? Uh, upgrading capabilities, making sure that capability has uh, what it takes to succeed in the battlefields at Lumen or Bow, and the capabilities our warfighters need. Um, so yes, it has to, the airplane we're looking for, you want that airplane to be a good fighter. And to be a good fighter, it's gotta be a good killing machine, correct? Um, it's gotta be a good fighter. It's gotta be a good strike platform for us as well, all right? Um, uh, it's, we want it to be able to do electronic warfare. I think that's one area that we look for growth inside the F-35 is in the ability to do electronic warfare as a stand-in jammer, not a standoff jammer. And why do I say that? More and more, our, we, I remember we went from single mission platforms and multi-mission platforms to, like Dave said, they've got to do a little bit of everything. Um, and why is that? Because things happen. And your plan, if you're going against a high-end threat and you've got to go into a target area and you're going to pe penetrate and your wayman gets, is a mort, or your, your support assets are more, you still have to be able to get the job done. You have to protect the guys on ground or, or solve that critical mission out there and bring the platform back to fight another day or, not, or later that day. So we like it to be able to do more. 
Um, we believe you, it, it's uh, being ready for the worst fight. You've got to have uh, an airplane that can penetrate and can fight in contested environment and survive, and, and not only survive, but uh, prevail and, and dominate as best you can. Um, sensors. Right now, the F-35 has got incredible sensors. Talking to the folks that are operating out there, it's, it is the smartest kid in class. It's going to be the smartest kid in class for, for some time. Um, what we'd like that thing to not only be a good sh shooter, a good sensor, but a good sharer. I think that airplane could be a better sharer right now than it is right now. Um, and then that's the taxpayer of me. Um, again, uh, once our customer, which is generally, uh, it's a MAGTAF, an infantry officer, sees what that airplane can do and what it sees, they want some of that as well. So that's an engineering challenge, and we're working on that uh, very hard uh, to make sure that the, the, that system can sense and can see and can shoot and kill and protect, um, but also can share that information. Because I think the best kind of airplane, and I've been reading a lot of, about the Second World War and about our Air Force, our Army Air Corps in the Second World War, and the, the, the step change that the Mustang brought to protecting the bomber fleet. And amazing. And again, it, was, it started off not so great and put a, a, a Rolls-Royce Merlin motor in there, and it changed uh, the course of history, I think. Um, but uh, bottom line is, you want that your participation in the fight out there to make everybody better, all right? I think the Mustang's participation in the fight in World War II made everybody better. Certainly made the bomber pilots uh, more confident they could get in and get it out again and get through the fighter belt. Um, making everybody better in a fifth, with a fifth generation airplane or an NGAD, um, you want to be use your sensors to make other players more effective, or have other players be able to reach it, make you more effective. I'm really energized by what I see, what the F-35s are doing uh, before I left active duty and what our, our, our Air Force and Army are doing with the airplane right now. Uh, we, uh, we basically did experiments and tests with Aegis cruisers and shooting uh, uh, standard missiles and basically guiding standard missiles that targets the ship couldn't see, but the F-35 could, and teaming that way. That's, that's a game changer. That actually cha allows the, our forces and our, and our nation as a, as, a, as a joint fight to project power more effectively. Just like we said, we have to power project, we have to get there, we have to win, and we have to come home. Allowing our Navy to be better shooters is something we all have a great interest in. This airplane allows us to do that, these sensors. Um, also, with our, uh, with our, our ground-based fires, our, our artillery fires, HIMARS, we're guiding and we're doing routinely now at the weapons school, guiding for, uh, ba uh, it's basically a lorazem in a can, but a HIMARS rocket, providing accurate targeting data for that, uh, for that rocket battery on the ground to go do long-range killing. And, and the new commandant has asked for a, a, a emphasis in the Marine Corps on long-range fires, 350 nautical miles. The F-35 will be a critical player in providing those fires. Uh, Multi-mission. Um, like I said, more on, the, uh, more on the electronic warfare side, and that's not just electronic warfare as we see it, but it's also the ES, the, the electronic uh, surveillance and the countermeasures as well. Um, and uh, I also think, too, uh, we talked about logistics and networks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but the Army also did, I think there's an orange flag we just did, is that correct? Where we just uh, basically, uh, F-35s were, were targeting for uh, the AIMD for the United States Army. So again, great synergy, and you take the, you put that airplane and these systems in the hands of the warfighters, the young guys and gals that are out there, um, their ingenuity, I talked to one of them just the other day, and he said, out at sea, uh, we've just be, we've just started to uh, unleash the capabilities of this airplane. We haven't tapped all its capability out there. And so mining that, to the Marine Corps, I think all of us should be really focused on getting as much as we can get out of F-35 and, 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 and advancing that as best we can. I would say building them in numbers. And I, you know, I don't work for somebody that builds F-35s, but one way to make the F-35 more expensive, now as a taxpayer, I do care about that and make it harder to sustain is to build less of them. Um, I would say if you have a, a production line out there, you ought to build them. I went down to the Lockheed plant when I was in active duty, and I saw a stick out there with an F-16 on it. It had some F-22s and F-35s on there, and it had a number, I don't know, something, I can't remember any thousands of those things we built. And I asked the people down there, I said, what did you plan on building when you started that airplane? What was your initial production run? It was like 960. Well, like, I, maybe 3,000 is too low, I don't know. But bottom line is we ought to be building these things and making them as cheap as we can, and then keeping that OEM and the people who build that airplane for us, keep, focus on cost, keep cost out, drive, uh, drive the radius numbers up, cost and ownership down so that uh, we can afford them to go dominate like we need to and for deploy. Um, on the logistics side, you know the Marine Corps, we bought this airplane that can land um, 
on a, on a short strip or an or a amphibious ship or a small carrier. Um, why? Um, again, it's about making sure that we have fighter coverage. Fighters, I think range is, is, is an important factor in that, but for the Marine Corps it was relative. Uh, we wanted our range, the important range for us was to be close to where we, you know, we could uh, fly from a sea base and support our guys on the ground. Also, too, we have found ways to air refuel so we can project, we can extend our range, but we have not figured out a way to air refuel just yet, or air rearm just yet. So bottom line is that basing posture allows us to employ ordnance, drop down on a ship or on a, uh, a forward base, rearm very quickly. And we do um, kind of like uh, NASCAR hot pits in the Marine Corps. You did it with Harriers and Hornets. We're now doing it with F-35. We don't shut the motor down. We rearm that airplane and basically get it back in the air again, then upping our sortie rate, making the smaller number of airplanes seem like it's more. Um, and the other thing I'll say is very proud member to serve in the Royal Air Force. It was a, I just came back from my two-year reunion. We just have reunions every two years over there. Um, I think the future fight is going to be not only a joint fight, but it's going to be a coalition fight. You need allies. You need friends. Um, really um, super jazzed that we have an airplane in the United States Marine Corps that can land on a short base, can land on an amphibious ship, but also we're going to deploy with the, with, the, with the Brits and the Queen Elizabeth and her maiden voyage. That's, that's an amazing thing that our nation would do that and my Marine Corps would do that. Um, but also, it, it portends the, the ability for us to think about what a joint fight, a coalition fight would look like in the future when you need every bit of real estate you can to power project Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Army, uh, coalition. Um, so I think what our plan uh, uh, it would be, would be what I would advocate for is um, extracting every ounce of capability out of that F-35, making it absolutely as cheap as we can to buy and sustain uh, and to maximize our combat capability uh, with that particular platform, uh, make it uh, no better, make it, make it the best friend out there for the guys on the ground, on uh, the guys at sea. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Okay, folks. Well, thanks very much for your perspectives. If I could summarize them at a macro level, I think a common theme amongst uh, um, all of our participants is that NGAD in the future is in whatever the next big thing is, uh, the underlying foundation is ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information. Uh, and we're going to have, as I mentioned in my remarks, we're going to have um, older generation airplanes for a long time. So those have to be able to fit into the equation as well. Um, uh, General Davis mentioned the importance of allied interoperability. We also have to come up with a, a system of systems, if you will, that makes it seamless to plug in uh, to our allies. So let's transition to the uh, discussion phase of our panel, and let me get them uh, warmed up uh, with a couple of softballs uh, for you all uh, to then uh, uh, come on board with I, a little I'd like harder to dispute pitch. that. <laughs> I, I've never heard you pitch yeah. a softball question. Yeah, he, he, he told me that these guys were in uniform, so I had to wear a tie today. So I <laughs> already put the mojo on me. Um, so the, this is for all of you. What attribute or attributes do you think will be the most significant change uh, for the next generation uh, of, uh, of aircraft? I, I won't say, I won't limit it to fighters. I'll just say aircraft and uh, open to any of you. I, I think the biggest change is from the beginning, it connects. And it connects with everything. And that means not only developing those technologies for what is coming, but going back, using software to find radios and communications, being able to link all that together. Because no matter what it, it is or what things we bring to bear, the combined sum is more than the parts. And that's what we know. And so anything that we do has to connect, it has to share, it has to learn, and it has to be able to take that data from wherever we gather it and then apply it for the punishment. So I'd offer uh, probably half the folks in this room have experienced this. Uh, if you don't have situational awareness, you die, <laughs> right? Doesn't matter if it's an F-5, an F, a MiG-21, and you may be flying the most souped up capability airplane that, that you have to offer. If you don't have situational awareness, you die. And so uh, that kind of, in my mind, is, the, is an attribute that General Crumb just described from the ability to connect. And, and right, so 
uh, you can look through the evolution of systems that have been uh, put in uh, air combat uh, aircraft over the last uh, 30 years, <laughs> and you wondered why some of these folks were grinning, and you came back with your tail between your legs. And then you got, I got, I got this little multifunction display, and, and it presented a line. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that gives me a lot of SA. I like that. And it, it, it took us forever to get it. That's the challenge, yeah. right? So in my humble opinion, it's situational awareness, but we have got to be able to iterate. And so, sir, can I borrow your iPhone? Yep, absolutely, it's a problem. This is the overused analogy. Can I have your iPad? <laughs> the one I broke yeah. the screen on? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, uh, what we need is an iPad that can change overnight, yeah. right? that we can suck electrons in, we can suck situational awareness off the, out of the battle space. That includes information from cyber, what, what happened in the cyber realm, thanks sir. You bet. Uh, so I'm, I'm using the underused analogy of the iPad now. You know, covering up is the overused analogy for the iPhone. But, but uh, being able to suck those, uh, that, itch, that situational awareness up and be able to make real time changes that affect what goes on the next day or the next hour. Because right now we're waiting we're waiting weeks and months, and we need to be in the minutes and hours uh, perspective. So there you have it, sir. I, I, I think uh, I concur with, with both these. I would say, and it, you know, as I think about uh, connecting and networks, it's, it is incredibly important. Um, and the, the next airplane needs to make sure it needs to connect with everybody. F thirty five connects with some very well right now, and needs to connect with more, uh, more effectively as we as we uh, roll out future iterations that airplane more capability. I also know from my time at the Cyber Command that networks are built. Networks are also going to be, if you covet that network, your adversary is going to try to take that network away from you. So networks can reform. We need to make sure that we have resilient uh, networks that can, can take a hit, uh, reform. But also, too, I think it goes back to that multi-mission platform. Um, if the adversary is successful in denying you that network, having a multi-mission platform can, can sense, see, see, shoot, both kinetic and non-kinetic rounds. I think the electronic warfare side of that is really important to make sure that, that we can still accomplish the mission, that th their, their win at taking that network away um, still allows our platform to get the job done uh, for, the, for the folks, for, the, for me, for the MACDAF commander, for the Joint Force commander to, uh, to bring folks home. The last thing I would say on speed, I have worked as a consultant now for, for two years, and I've been in the commercial sector. I've been uh, with a, a company out of Silicon Valley um, speed's really important. We have to be a lot faster. I would say for our OEMs, um, I would say, I'll use the iPhone analogy, we want to be more like Apple than what we are right now. So if I have a new capability, I want to integrate the new capability quickly, right? Not wait for a POM cycle and a, it should, so the open architecture, which is pretty proud, we started with the Harrier a long, a long time ago, we've had it in the Harrier for a long time, allows me to integrate new systems on the airplane very, very quickly. That has to be something that Speed, the new idea can't take four years to get an airplane. The new idea has to be able to get on the airplane quickly. Thanks. Very good. Okay, we got lots of folks here, so let's transition to hear what's on your mind. So, uh, questions from the floor. Yes, sir. Yeah, please state your name, rank, and serial number, and uh, <laughs> who you are and before you ask the question. Uh, Steve Trumbull with Aviation Week. Um, I, I want to I make sure I understand something about what you're saying uh, with the change in next generation air dominance as a concept. Up until about a year or two ago, we heard a lot about an FX program uh, within this family of systems. That, that there would be something like um, an F-22 monolithic style platform that could perform the full range of missions for the 2030s and 2040s, you know, sort of VHF stealth, and, uh, directed energy weapons, and so forth. Is that, is that gone now? Is, has that been removed from the concept of next generation air dominance um, and replaced by this idea of using existing systems augmented with uh, the sort of the sensory series style uh, mission specific or you know maybe even multi-mission but not the full range of missions that F we, we look at F-22 or F-35 do today. Uh, so uh, you know and it is you know why why was that change made? You know what is it about the future of warfare if, if that is what took place that, that rules out that kind of platform that we've known for the last 50 years. I, I have an opinion, but you go first. Okay. 
<laughs> Steve, thanks. Uh, here's what I'll tell you. We would be negligent as airmen if we weren't looking at everything. And so what I'll tell you is there is nothing that we're not looking at. But the focus in the so far in the past has been on a platform or a thing. And so we've really broadened the discussion. I think the General Goldfein has led us in this multi-domain concept where there is no one thing that's going to cure everything. And so we are going to look at airplanes. We are going to look at unmanned, manned. We are going to look at cyber. We're going to look at space. We are going to look at everything that we have to do because what we know is the network of things. And it's not that the older systems aren't going to be a part of that. We are going to bring them in the new systems have to be a part of that as well. But as we go forward, it takes a long time to replace our systems. And that's where the chief is. He knows that we're gonna be fighting a combination of our older with whatever comes next. And as we merge those together is where we think we need to go. But what we've really been trying to do, and we know this from the work that General Pantini and his folks have been doing, the future is connectivity and network. It's resilient, redundant networks like General Davies was talking about. But it's not just one thing. It doesn't mean there won't be trucks on that highway, but the highway is more important than the trucks. And, uh, Steve, so what I, your, your question denoted a one or a zero, hmm. that we've made that decision and to reinforce what General Crum just said. So I would ask that to correct the record, it's not a one or a zero, right? We have current investments that we uh, that we have and will continue to maintain, and we need to improve those, which is part of the Air Superiority 2030 uh, flight plan execution, as well as looking at what that future brings. And so, you know, certainly you can template there's going to be a widget, you know, we, but that widget, you know, like a, a major part of that widget needs to be an open mission system. It needs to incorporate UCI. Now, if those are not the specific uh, technical and acquisition, but the concept of being able to, because right now our systems are not open. My, you know, it took me so long to get a line on my multifunction display. I mean, we want to be able to do that at scale and speed. Uh, conceptually, right, we want to be able to kill, to close thousands of kill chains in hundreds of hours. That's what we plan to do. John. Air Force Magazine. Thank you. Uh, Congress is notoriously skeptical of things that are labeled systems of systems, and they just took half a billion dollars out of NGAD. So obviously that approach didn't work. What's your poster child? What's your strategy? What's plan B to, uh, to get this funded and convince Congress this is the way we need to go? Over to you. I sense a trend. Uh, you are AQP. <laughs> uh, a, a much much prettier AQP. For those of you who don't know, I, General Pantini is uh, I got fired. The godfather of AQP uh, several cycles ago. So so John, what, what I'll say is uh, we're we're act, we're going to uh, actually talk to Congress, and I think we know the future, and and we've got to do a, a really good job of articulating to Congress uh, what that really means, and. This mindset of the family of systems, you're right. There, there's some scar tissue uh, in the past uh, mm -hmm. from that. But we know that networked systems are the way of the future. And developing these technologies in parallel to go on old, yeah. new systems, designing whatever comes into the, the fight that we have, is going to be key for us. And it's, it's really the way of the future. But what we're going we're to engage with Congress, show them that our path ahead and where we go. And my analogy, and it's probably a poor one, is Twitter. So the app, should we use the iPad? Uh, the app, Twitter, what is 140 <laughs> characters? Or Broken. It may have doubled in the past. It's like uh, what, is that, what does that do if someone has a Twitter app? If one person has it? Not much. If 100 people have it? Not much. But when thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have Twitter, the way it connects, we're sharing data, where someone sees something, someone can verify something, someone can add to the conversation, 
anywhere and everywhere, and the data is accessible by millions. That's the vision that we see. All of these platforms are connected, and it brings a piece of the puzzle that we're looking for. And so the rest of the systems that are all connected fill in the rest of that puzzle piece and passing the data back and forth. That's the family of systems. And we, we know that that's the future because we see it in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's the same for warfare. So John, let me uh, also preview. Uh, I mean, f number one, we gotta go fight, right? We gotta go fight for what's right. Uh, so why uh, my organization stood up was exactly this challenge of, of uh, you know, kind of disjointed uh, messages, if you will, uh, that folks kind of, I really don't understand what you mean by that. And so we talk about multi-domain command control. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, I, w I wake up every morning. In fact, I found a rock today <laughs> on, I picked up and I said, oh my gosh, there's another, there's another multi-domain command and control person that needs to be brought into the fold, right? Um, the beautiful thing is what we're going to try and do is as we stand up cross-functional teams to take on these challenges uh, that has this centralized leadership, if you will. Um, that extends uh, from multi-domain command and control, extends into the air superiority 2030. You know, who's responsible to shepherd these enterprise programs or these enterprise things? <laughs> uh, you're looking at them, right? Uh, so one of the things that's been confusing to a lot of folks as well is, well, I don't really understand this multi-domain command and control, and I really don't understand, you know, advanced battle management. I really don't understand next generation air dominance. So what we see in the future is this cross-functional team, you know, having leadership that goes to the hill and explains exactly what we mean. And we need to have a lineage of what we're talking about from lines of effort that goes to a program element. So that we can go, here's what, this is what I'm talking about. This is why that particular pot of money is targeted towards this line of effort. And then we need to show progress towards that. And so that's what I would offer is uh, that, you know, that's one of the rocks we got to put in our proverbial ruck uh, with respect to the mark on NGAD. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, uh, Sil Lindhurst, ACI. To achieve this next generation air dominance, what does the next generation airmen look like? For example, what skills need to be added or strengthened? What bad habits need to be lost? But to achieve all this, it still requires a human being. So how do we get a better human being to help? Uh, I, I, I feel passionately about this. I, I have a second Lieutenant Fantini running around right now. Uh, I have a, a cadet uh, at the Air Force Academy and another that's threatening to go on ROTC. We, we have got to enable our young folks, people with gray hair and no hair, like you see, at least here, uh, we have the authority we have got to push authority down. These young officers, young airmen are these, they love the multitask environment. They love to code. <laughs> Don't look at me. Uh, but we need to empower them and unleash them. So, you know, a future airman might look like a software engineer that's able to go, you know what? That's able to sit with an operator and go, I don't like what I did yesterday. Can you help me? And the, and the coder says, yeah, man, I can make that happen. I mean, in my mind, there's a, there, that type of pivoting into the future and getting to a digital Air Force uh, where we see airmen with those types of skills. I have cadet crum in ROTC as well. Now, here's what I'll tell you. The people coming into our Air Force, we just need to take advantage of who they are. They are used to this. They are connected. They demand to be joined up and collaborative and energized with each other. And we bring them in and we tend to put stovepipes about what they can do and, wh and where they go. And we've just got to take advantage of who they are. They, they grew up this way. And so our Air Force needs to take advantage of that. I think our airmen of the future are exactly who they are today. We just need to utilize that. Dave, I could not, I would say on the, from the joint side, the milk, he's, we have probably the best generation of young people in uniform and coming in uniform we've ever had. I mean, they're, I mean, it's just a source of great pride for our, for me and everyone that, that knows these folks, how good they are. I think same thing, you want to empower, push, you know, equip the man, not man the equipment, right? Give them the tools. And that's not a 
boy or girl thing, that's human being thing. Give them the tools to succeed. I'd also say, one of the things we talked about going fast and getting new capabilities in there, they're relatively impatient people. They're used to picking <laughs> up technology and having instant access to it and say, well, they don't understand POM cycles, nor does most of the customer. And I think the Joint Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, how we better empower the people to use the gear that we're developing, um, you know, designing in the, the ability for them to, to pull information off, uh, off-border information, make, again, how we, whatever kind of airplane we put in the sky, manned or unmanned, how it empowers everybody in the battlefield to be more effective. That's what they're used to with technology. I think that's what they're going to demand from us. Thank you. Uh, John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Um, can you flesh out um, the CFT concept? Are you kind of looking at the Army model where they set up CFTs to pursue their top six modernization priorities? And can you say, you know, when these might be established and, you know, how many there might be, what categories they're going to be in charge of? Absolutely. Um, and so uh, we've begun to stand them up right now. We are kind of... Uh, uh, skiing in the wake of the Army, if you will, uh, in terms of kind of learning uh, uh, where they've been on their proverbial journey. Uh, my organization is kind of, there's, there's, there's elements of equivalency in various areas, but not exact uh, with Army Futures Command. Uh, so we've stood up a multi-domain command and control, uh, or multi-domain command and control cross-functional team. Uh, really involved with the joint and uh, coalition interagency pieces and really working closely with the uh, acquisition executives architect, uh, uh, Dr. Roper hired a gentleman named Mr. Preston Dunlap to make inroads uh, and he's brought a lot of good framework and structure to that effort. Uh, we've stood up a position navigation and timing cross-functional team. Uh, in total, we plan on standing up 10 under AFWIC per se but uh, that was the rock I turned over this morning. I found out that uh, DOD or uh, DOD CIO or, or uh, oh USDI, pardon me, USDI has a cross-functional team as well, which is fine. You know, it's not we're not brand we're not we don't have a brand on or patent on cross-functional teams. But it's now just better a little the ability to synchronize better, and so I want to take it past the kind of the buzzword aspect of it, and really what a cross-functional team needs to do is they need to understand what problem they're trying to solve. They need to understand and write down a strategy of how they want to get that. And then they need access to leadership and not two-star leadership. They need access to four-star undersecretary level leadership within our department. And if you template that larger within the defense department to get uh, top cover on yes, go do, or no, I don't like that, we're gonna change. And so our concept of that is to use our capability development council uh, and and that I've kind of said I can go I can go to three o'clock on cross-functional teams. I can, I can happily follow up with you. But we see that as a small centralized team that's matrixed across major commands. It's matrixed across the staffs that are focused on a problem. Um, and uh, we see this as generating combat power. We see this as logistics. We see this as space. We see this in cyber. So all we expect to stand up teams along those lines. So there should be about 10 uh, standing teams for the Air Force. Valerie. Hi, Valerie Insano with Defense News. Um, so you gentlemen really footstopped that NGAD is going to be a family of systems and that the network is the most important part. But can you kind of give us some breadcrumbs about what those systems might look like? I mean, you've, you've both mentioned that you are talking about multitudes of systems mm -hmm. that are working simultaneously to deliver effects. Um, that seems like that could look a lot different than the type of constructs that we have right now, the type of platforms that we have right now. Um, so could you kind of drill down just a little bit, and when might we see some of this fielded? So I'll, I'll take uh, the initial hack at that. I mean, uh, so it means, uh, hey, let's connect the F-22 and F-35. Let's, uh, let's ensure that they have the, the best available weapon today. Uh, let's ensure that the operations center uh, that's, in, that's uh, working uh, with those platforms are aware and understand the cyber effects that are going on simultaneously and how you create synergy there. Uh, the quarterbacking analogy that General Goldfein likes to use in terms of information coming from space, 
that's executing with an F-35 quarterback, that's uh, communicating with an Army ground element that could be supported with uh, a subsurface uh, capability. The ability to bring all that together. Now, in terms of, uh, of specific uh, uh, widgets and systems, I mean, you can just template that with what we have in the current program of record with respect to capabilities. Um, and, and that's what we kind of see moving forward in the future. I, I can't give you a prescription on exactly that we're going to roll out uh, this C2 system tomorrow or what have you, but I don't have that granularity with me right now. Okay. Fargo. Hi, uh, Vaga Maradian with uh, Defense and Aerospace Report. Dave, thanks very much. Tremendous panel. Um, you know, mil military imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So what are some of the things that our allies are doing uh, or our adversaries that you guys think are important enough for us to adopt? You know, whether it's kind of the Swedish uh, approach to data links, whether it's the French approach to cloud combat, what are some of these ideas or stuff that the Chinese and Russians are working? that you think would give us the greatest effects, uh, you know, air effects from, you know, whether the, for the United States or its allies? I, I think uh, looking at some of the, the weapons they're developing, uh, long range weapons, I think some of those are really good. I also think too, the, how they're, they're op looking at, some of them especially live in the range fan of uh, ballistic missile threat um, how they're thinking about distributing their force and operating out there. Um, and, and I think those are some of the big things. I, I'm a big coalition warfare guy, and I think the, um, asking them and learning from them is really smart. I, I don't have all the details, but I would say I've seen some of the stuff on long-range weapons, some of the emphasis on electronic warfare, um, really inspiring. And, break your, and, and also in some of the ships, are, uh, in particular, our British allies are building, that is, that's an incredible capability from both a, a power projection standpoint from ground forces, but also naval air forces. So I'd offer uh, something to look at is, uh, what's a cost imposing strategy on our potential enemies? Mm -hmm. We found success in that earlier in uh, our history. And so we need to understand pivoting into the future, what does that look like? And so I think uh, when you look at what uh, our potential adversaries have learned from, from us, we absolutely need to, to learn from them as well. Uh, along the coalition lines, uh, I th we need to be coalition friendly uh, from the start. Too many times it, we, we, we end up uh, kind of going, oh, oh yeah, by the way. And by then, many things have kind of technically been set or what have you. And so I would offer that we need to get better as a department and as an Air Force in particular of, of bringing in coalition sooner. Back the room, yes, ma'am. Hi, Courtney Alvin with Inside Defense. Um, I wanted to ask about the role that the F-15 EX might play in uh, next generation air dominance. Um, a lot of the discussion that we've heard, um, concerns about buying more fourth gen aircraft um, have been pit against the need for new capability, or new capacity, I'm sorry. Um, so can, can you discuss um, the role of the F-15X as a possible uh, vessel for some of these NGAD technologies? And does the fourth gen, fifth gen dis argument, debate, whatever, uh, like miss the point of, of this possibility, I guess? Well, look, we're committed to the F-35. Let's just make sure we, we still say we are committed to that. And what we've done, and we've engaged in Congress, and we're really grateful the support we've received from Congress in the fact that we need to replace our aging fleet at a very rapid rate. General Deptula talked about uh, our fleet. It's, it's not an aging fleet, it's an aged fleet. And so we engaged with Congress to say, look, we know we need today to replace our fighters at least at a rate of 72 per year. And in our budget, we tried to get after that in the best way that we could. When you talk about warfare, you notice that we never talked about only the future, or only this. We know we're gonna be fighting with a, a vast array of systems. Any system we have, or any system that we're going to get, we connect. And when you bring that together, each of those systems are gonna bring a certain part to the equation. They will not bring equal parts to the equation. And so what we know in the future 
is no matter what it is, it connects, it shares, and it then distributes that data across each other. And we'll be have we will have fourth generation airplanes for a long time, and we have to integrate them together. So as we look forward, we know that we need to get to a better capacity in our Air Force when it comes to our fighter force. We've made that pitch to Congress. We think that they understand, and we think that they are helping us do that. But whatever it is we have, we will make work. Okay, folks, we've come to the end of our uh, hour-long period. I'm sure these gentlemen would be happy to, to stand around, stay around if they can, uh, to entertain a couple more questions. But before we finish, I would offer for um, your uh, uh, study, if you will, a document uh, entitled uh, Evolving Technologies in Warfare in the 21st Century, Introducing the Combat Cloud, that explains some of these ideas of seamless sharing of information. You can find it on the Mitchell Institute uh, website. So a uh, little plug for some of the work we've been doing out there. So I think all of you would agree that uh, the panel members have done a magnificent job and they stand by to continue to help understand, help you understand uh, this evolving concept of next generation air dominance. Please join me in thanking them for their remarks.